Good morning. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the regulation of natural gas in Pennsylvania. I know a lot of people have very strong opinions um, and, and very strongly held beliefs in this area, so I'm not necessarily telling you what it should be. Um, I'm just telling you what the, what, the stat, what the state of the law is in terms of statutes and, and regulations, and then certainly everyone can form their own opinions as to um, you know, where changes would best be made in, in this regulatory framework. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask as we go through. I, I'd like to, even though this is somewhat of a formal room, I'd like to have the, the discussion be more interactive. Um, I think that kind of helps me to direct the topics to really what, what you're most interested in. So feel free to ask questions. If we start to go too far astray, may need to kind of rein things back in to, to, keep, us, uh, to keep us moving through. Uh, just to start out, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm on the, the faculty of, of Penn State's law school. I'm the director of the agri, one of the hats that I wear is director of, of the Agricultural Law Resource and Reference Center, which was established by state statute back in the, in the late 90s when Penn State and the Dickinson School of Law merged. And the, the idea at that time was to take advantage of the expertise and the and the, uh, the his history of both of those institutions to uh, focus on agricultural law because there, there didn't, at that time, there didn't exist any other entity that was looking at a lot of the legal issues that impact agriculture and, and, and food production. So the, the basic purpose of, of the Ag Law Center is to um, be a resource for a wide variety of, of uh, constituents to, to disseminate that information. So, the way that I've, I've disseminated information is through presentations such as this, other educational programs, publications, uh, an electronic newsletter, a website with a lot of resources, and then we, we've started a, a, a few blogs. So <clears throat> if, you ha if you're looking for resources related to particular agricultural topics, we have a number of resource areas on our website. And uh, so Right to Farm, Acre, Clean and Green, um, we're, we're expanding those over time, but the idea is we take a topic in and try to provide all of the legal references in kind of a one-stop shopping. With regard to, um, and I'll have those, these websites will be at the, on the last slide. I did not make copies of my slides, but if anyone would like a copy, I, you can send me an email afterwards. I come up afterwards and I can give you a card and you can, you can send an email requesting the PowerPoint. Um, with specifically with regard to Marcella Shale issues, we have a resource area that has stat links to statutes, regulations, court cases that have been decided over the last couple years, and some other legal, legal related materials as, as well. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, I just want to go through a little bit of a background of Marcella Shale, and this may be familiar to all of you, but I think sometimes it's helpful to just make sure that, that we're all on the same page as far as that background. And then I'm going to talk about the statutes in Pennsylvania that, that govern natural gas operations. We'll talk about the legislation that has been passed in the last couple years, talk about regulatory development, so the government agencies that are implementing those statutes at the state and federal level, and then we'll talk about local regulation, and that's a topic that has been receiving a, a lot of attention. Okay, so we'll try to move through all of, all of these topics, and, and Leah will keep me on track as far as, the, uh, as far as the time. Okay, I think when you're thinking at where we are right now in Pennsylvania, I think it's helpful to think back to the history, because that's, that kind of puts it in context, and that's helped to shape where we are today from a, from a legal and, and regulatory perspective. Pennsylvania was the birthplace of, of the oil industry with the, the drilling of, of the Drake well o over 150 years ago. And that kind of set off a, a lot of speculatory activity in western Pennsylvania, which eventually led to um, a, a lot of natural gas development as well. And the, the Haymaker Well, which is uh, in Murraysville, about probably 20 miles outside of Pittsburgh, was a very, very productive early natural gas well. And I guess I shouldn't say productive because it actually was a very wasteful natural gas well because it was, it was struck when the Haymaker brothers were, were looking for oil 
and they struck this natural gas seam, the earth um, shook for, a, you know, I think it's days or weeks. It shook for a long time for a very long distance as this gas was released, and it was just vented into the air for, for years. Eventually, that, the gas from that well and some other nearby wells were, were piped into Pittsburgh, and so Pittsburgh became the, the first city to, to have natural gas piped to it. So that's just, you know, that's the historic background in, in Pennsylvania. And you look, at the, you look at the data from the early 1900s, Pennsylvania was very much a, a dominant player in the natural gas industry. 43% of the total natural gas, the value of natural gas extracted in the U.S. was from Pennsylvania. 37% of the active wells were in Pennsylvania. 42% of the pipeline miles for natural gas was in Pennsylvania. So this kind of paints the picture that there was a lot of activity. Pennsylvania was definitely a, a focal point of development at that time. And you, you flash forward to 2005, and you know, why did I pick 2005? Well, that's when the first gas was extracted from the Marcellus well. So what was the state of the activity in Pennsylvania in 2005? Well, Pennsylvania was now 16th nationally in natural gas production, but it still remained third nationally in the number of active gas wells. So that kind of paints the picture that we had a lot, we still had a lot of gas wells, but they obviously weren't very productive relative to gas wells elsewhere in the country for us to be third in the number of wells, but 16th in the, in the uh, production from, from those wells. So, you know, why do, why do we go, th well, and then now let's flash forward to 2005. We, we have the rents number well, one number one well drilled in Washington County by Range Resources, and that kind of marked a, I guess you could call it a quiet transformation, at least at that time, because the public certainly was not aware of, of what was happening. Um, but we've seen a very rapid increase since that, that rents number one well in 2005. So we've had a lot of, inc a, a much more activity uh, the, the activity has expanded into areas of Pennsylvania that did not have a s historic background of, of um, oil or, or gas drilling in the north central and northeastern Pennsylvania. The, the technologies and the techniques that are being used are adapted or somewhat being used in a new application from what the uh, traditional production has been. There's just been a lot of dollars, a lot of money that has caused a lot of new players to come and, and get involved. And we've seen a lot of international companies getting involved in, in the activities as well. So, so why, why do we go through that background? We're talking about regulation. Why is this background relevant? Well, that, that sets the stage for why we have the regulatory framework that, that we have today. It really is based on historic production for the most part. It's based on historic production and we're now trying to kind of catch up, we're trying to, um, making some changes to the, the framework to fit the activity that's, that's going on today. And also, you know, a lot of disputes are resolved through the court system, and a lot of the case law that we're relying on is from the late 1800s or the early 1900s when there was a lot of activity in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania's oil and gas law, even though we were the site of the first well, really is not that well developed. There are a lot of areas where uh, we just, we don't have court decisions resolving certain issues, and that's a result of, of the history that we've had where through the 20th century, Pennsylvania was certainly not a, a major player in, in the oil and gas industry. So let's, um, just what is Marcellus Shale? It's, it's natural gas that's contained within a shale rock. And, and shale, you know, Marcellus shale, there certainly are other shales as well, but shale is generally recognized as what's called a source rock, meaning that the, it's not very porous, it's not very permeable, gas does not travel through the shale very easily, but it, it does travel over, you know, hundreds, thousands of years, or millions of years, I'm not a geologist, but it, it does migrate over time. And it's a source rock because that's where the gas for a lot of the, the um, 
natural gas operations that we've had in Pennsylvania originated in a shale formation and migrated into a sandstone formation where it became trapped in a reservoir. So Marcellus Shale is, is the source of a lot, or, or shale in general, is the source originally of a lot of the gas that we have been extracting in Pennsylvania over the last hundred, hundred plus years. The technologies that are being used today allow for the gas to be extracted from the shale formation. We don't have to wait for those thousands or millions of years for the gas to migrate. Companies are able to use through hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, they're able to actually directly extract the gas from the shale formation. So that's, that's just kind of generally what Marcellus shale is. It's a rock that contains gas. <clears throat> I think you have to remember that, that natural gas necessarily, or natural gas extraction necessarily involves some surface disturbance. But Marcellus shale development is, is somewhat different than traditional development. And you can look at, at just some, some very basic differences. On Marcellus development, the well pads are much larger. I mean, there's much more of a surface impact when you have a, a well that's being drilled. There is a much greater use of water. And it's possible to put multiple wells on one well pad. So where there is a a well located, the surface disturbance is going to be much greater than it is for, or than it was, or is for traditional development. On the other hand, because of horizontal drilling and, <clears throat> and the ability to put multiple wells on one well pad, <clears throat> there are fewer well pad sites that are necessary with these technologies than is the case with traditional drilling. And, and you know, I'm not here to, to balance that out to say, okay, well, what's the overall impact? I just want to point out that it's different. You know, the surface impacts are much greater where a well is, but we do not have to have as many well site locations or well pad locations. Okay, this is a map showing the, and you've probably seen this map with the, 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 the Marcellus footprint. One thing that I want to point out on this, on this map is the, the dotted line that uh, starts in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania and runs you know, up a uh, northeastern direction. This is the demarcation between so-called wet gas and dry gas. Wet gas is gas that has other constituents like uh, propane, butane, that have to be extracted out before the gas is marketed. So, they so it requires processing, but those constituents are priced more closely in line with oil. Right now, gas prices are very low, oil prices are very high. That means that there is somewhat of a shift or it's more attractive for companies to develop the wet gas than it is to develop the dry gas. And so that, that has an impact on where uh, you know, certainly if drilling is occurring a lot of north central PA, northeastern PA, which is a dry gas area, and that development is continuing, but based on the prices, that may cause there to be somewhat of a shift, and we've seen some, um, some notices from companies that, that reflect that, where uh, Chesapeake in particular has indicated that they're, they're shifting their, their operations more to uh, the wet gas, and, and that causes a, an increased attention in the Utica shale, which has a footprint that generally underlies the Marcellus, but is, is shifted more western. But because of the, the focus on the wet gas, that's caused a greater focus in Ohio, and it's caused a greater focus in western Pennsylvania, like um, uh, Crawford, Venango, Lawrence, those counties are more attractive to, to, to companies because of that pricing, the issue right now. Okay, this shows a map of other shale gas basins in the, U, in the U.S. Just to kind of put in perspective, you can see the Marcellus. It's certainly not the only or the Utica, but they are very large. And this graphic shows you the progression of wells in Pennsylvania. And I'll just let this cycle through a couple times, but you can see where the development is occurring and uh, you can just see how it has, has dramatically increased over a, a f just a few number of years. So we have the two main pockets in southwestern Pennsylvania, Washington, Greene County, and then we have a, a, uh, another area in Bradford, Susquehanna County, 
but there are wells in 30-something counties. So throughout that area, we have wells that, that are lo located throughout the area. Okay, so that's, that's just as much of the background as I, as I wanted to talk about. Um, now moving into the, the Pennsylvania statutes that, that regulate the, the act, uh, oil and gas activities. This is a listing of, of the, uh, basically the, the table of contents in Title 58 of the Pennsylvania statutes, listing the various statutes that have application. The Oil and Gas Act is, is by far the statute that has the most impact on development in, in Pennsylvania. We'll talk about the Oil and Gas Act. I'll make a mention, uh, talk briefly about the, the Oil and Gas Conservation Law, talk briefly about the Dormant Oil and Gas Act, but we'll spend most of the time in statutes talking about the Oil and Gas Act. Just, I guess, one thing to point out, these are, for the most part, these are not environmental statutes. There are some environmental statutes that have application to oil and gas drilling along with a number of other areas like the Clean Streams Law, the uh, Dam Safety and Encroachment Act, but these are the statutes that are specifically focused on oil and gas extraction. The Oil and Gas Act is broken down into different chapters. Chapter 2 is where most of the specific requirements are contained. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of those requirements. But, but first, I want to just uh, highlight the purpose that's indicated in the Oil and Gas Act. And it's a, it's a multifaceted purpose. On one hand, this, the General Assembly has determined that it wants to permit optimal development of the resource consistent with protecting health, safety, and in the, in the environment. So it's, it's trying to, it's, to look on both sides of the equation to say we want to permit development, but we want to protect safety of, of employees, we want to protect property, we want to protect natural resources. So it's, it's, it has some environmental protections, but it's not strictly an environmental uh, a statute designed with environmental protection. It's a statute that's designed to permit development consistent with those protections. So the general requirements, this, these are, um, you know, most of the, there, there are a few other requirements, but this, you can kind of get the general idea of the type of, of issues that are addressed in the Oil and Gas Act, and we'll talk in more detail about some of these requirements, but it provides for permitting of wells, for um, re location restrictions, where can you not put a well, how do you have to restore the site when the drilling activities are complete, the water protection, uh, reporting, bonding, these are all topics that are, that are addressed. So with permitting, before a company drills a well, they are required to obtain a permit from DEP. The company, prior to applying for that permit, they have to give notice to the surface owner, to landowners that have water supplies within a thousand foot radius of the proposed well, and then to, uh, to, to owners and operators of coal seams. So, there's, so there are certain individuals that must be notified. So if you are located or if you have a, a well, a water well located within a thousand feet of the proposed well, you will get notified before the well is drilled. It will have a, a map showing where the well is going to be drilled. There is the ability to object to the grant of a permit, but the bases for objecting are pretty limited. They're, they're limited based on um, an improper location of the well or that there's inaccurate information. So while DEP reviews this information to grant the permit, they're not undergoing an extensive evaluation before they grant the permit. So you know, I, wouldn't, I don't think you can describe it as a rubber stamp, but it, it certainly is not a, a thorough evaluation. And, and that's based on the statutory, the requirements of the statute. So that's, that's not a criticism of, of DEP, that's just what the, what the law requires. With the location restrictions, when a landowner signs or a natural gas owner signs a lease, they can put restrictions in their lease. But assuming that there are no restrictions, then these statutory provisions will pr provide that a well can't be located within 200 feet of a building or water well, within 100 feet of a 
spring, stream, body of water, or wetland larger than an acre. Now that certainly is not a very long distance, particularly when you consider we're talking about the well. The well pad is going to be much larger than, than the well itself. And when, I, when I'm talking about the, any of these numbers that I'm going to go through, that's what the law is today. It might not be what the law is tomorrow, because there certainly are a lot of discussions about changing some of, of these distances. But this, is, this reflects the state of, of the law right, right now. There, the, uh, an operator can obtain a waiver from these uh, location restrictions. DEP is supposed to impose conditions to protect people, property, and waters. Just going back to leases, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about leases, but we have these, these distances which are relatively small, but they can be waived, and so it's possible that a landowner could waive those distance restrictions in the lease. When, after drilling operations have... Um, well, or while drilling operations are, are going on, companies have to comply with certain requirements, certain erosion and sediment control requirements. When the, when the drilling is completed, then the surface estate must be restored. Uh, this must be done generally within nine months after the well is completed. That time period can be extended. And there's an issue with, uh, you know, how does this apply when you have multiple wells on one well site? So if you have one well that's drilled and then say a year or 15 months later you have another well that's, that's drilled, it's possible that you could have a well site that's not restored for a period of years because you have multiple wells that are, that are being put, put on that site. And I think this is one example of the law really being drafted, thinking of that traditional production where you have one well, the activity moves on where under the current development you can have, you know, six, eight, ten wells on, on one, well site, one well site. Section 207 provides for groundwater protection or some provisions. Casing is required when the drilling is going through the fresh water strata as well as through certain coal seams. And th this is an area where we've had some regulatory activity addressing the casing, and then also the, the waste fluids have to be treated in compliance with the, uh, with the clean streams law, and this is another area where, where we've had some regulatory activity. Looking at protection from an individual owner or an in the individual's standpoint of if, if someone has their water well contaminated, the well operator is required to restore or replace any water supply that's polluted or diminished. So they, they, if they um, re, um, damage it, they have to replace it. There is a, a presumption of liability that kicks in to determine who has to prove whether they have contaminated that water supply. So if you are located within a thousand feet of a water well, if, if the gas well is within a, a thousand feet of a water well, you know, you can draw a circle around that, that gas well, and within that thousand foot radius, any water supplies that are in that radius, the company is presumed liable if any pollution happens within six months of the, 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 uh, the completion of drilling. So the gas company, within that circle, the gas company has to prove that they did not cause the pollution. If you're outside that radius, then the, then the landowner, the water uh, well owner, has to prove that the gas company caused that pollution. Now, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a huge matter because it, it can be difficult to prove. So that presumption of liability makes it easier for landowners within that 1,000-foot radius. This is another area where the distances and the time limits have been the subject of discussion to possibly increase, but again, right now, it's 1,000 feet, uh, six months. So a company will virtually always do a water test within that 1,000-foot radius because if there is pollution, they want to be able to demonstrate that they didn't cause it. A lot of water wells have problems. You know, before gas drilling, they had problems. And so gas companies will do a water test to protect themselves. They'll do a water test so that if there is a problem, they can demonstrate that, that they didn't cause that problem. 
a lot of landowners will, uh, you know, landowners will get a copy of that, of that water test. It will be done by an independent lab. Some landowners will choose to get their own test. That's a decision that an individual landowner can make. But um, if you, you should not, a landowner should not refuse permission for that water sample because if, if that permission is refused, then the presumption is lost. Yes, question. They don't have to test for anything. Okay, but they have to do a test. They, you know, the, it, it's, in their, it's in their interest to do a test, right. but they're not required to do a test. So, you know, what are they going to test for? Um, you know, I think every company is going to make their own determination, but I think they're going to look at what are the potential problems. I mean, the reason that they're doing the test is so that they can prove that they didn't cause right. a problem that was there. So what they're going to be testing for are things that, that may be likely problems in that area. So it may, it may depend, it may vary from, from area to area. If you have a, an area, you know, say methane migration, that's been a big problem. There are some areas that are more susceptible to that issue, so that may be more of a, I, I think they probably would test for that everywhere now, but in those areas that, that are more susceptible to that issue, they're probably more likely to test for, for that. So, you know, they're not testing to just, I mean, they're testing to protect themselves. It's in their interest to do that test. And so as a landowner, you know, you may want to find out if, if you're, if you're accept, you know, if, if you find out what they're testing for, and that may guide your decisions as far as whether it's advisable to test for, for something else. And there are, there are resources that are available that can kind of help landowners decide you know, whether they want to test what, what they should be testing for. But it's important that you do the testing, obviously, before drilling happens. I think you want to be as, as close to before drilling happens, but I think probably within a year before drilling happens to get that, that water test, uh, because it's, it's going to have a lot less value if, if, you know, if drilling has already taken place or if it's 20 years old, it's not going to have as, as much value. Yeah. You know, to, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there are different water services. If the DEP recognizes some labs and not others for testing, uh, I mean, this is an area I don't I don't have a lot of knowledge on the specifics of the testing. There there are labs that are I, I believe that there are labs that are accredited by DEP. I'm not sure exactly what that uh, accreditation means. But, um, you know, Leah, when you, you had some speakers that, that dealt with, with water wells, and I think you have some resources on your website. We have um, some resources on, uh, if you go to www.pipeline.org. And I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this so I can put it into the tape. If you go to www.pasafarming.org slash Marcellus Shale Choices. And so there's more information about the, the water issues there. So that, that's kind of getting outside of my area, so I would just direct you to that. But as far as the, the presumption of liability, you know, that, that is definitely a, a, a legal issue. And I think the one, I think the important thing is to make sure you don't refuse permission as a landowner. Because then if there's a problem, you're going to have to prove that the gas company caused, caused that problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you, you'll get a copy. Again, it, it, it has to be an independent person, so it shouldn't be someone from the gas company that's coming out to do that. Uh, so it, it should be an independent, an independent lab. Um, you know, people have different, different opinions on whether they, they're going to rely on that test or whether they're going to get a, a second test. Some people will say, well, I'll wait and see what that says and then make a decision as to whether I get a, a second test. Some companies are going beyond 1,000 feet to maybe 3,000 feet or even up to 5,000 feet and, and doing the testing. They could be doing that for you know, a number of different reasons, um, public relations, maybe they think the statute would change and they want to protect themselves. But regardless, you know, if, if you get that test, you can make a decision as to whether you want to, to do a test in addition to that. Okay, there are reporting requirements built into the statute as well num at a number of different steps in the process. 
companies have to file a completion report within 30 days after drilling is completed. They also have to file production reports. And this is a, a, one of the, the changes in the, in, in the statute over the last couple years. They have to file for Marcellus or, or shale wells. They have to file production reports every six months with DEP. So on, on August 15th and February 15th, they have to file that production data. And this is, this is a, quite a change from prior to the legislation where reporting was done every year and that reports, those reports were kept confidential for five years. So it was not very transparent as far as uh, what the production numbers were. DEP is required to put this information on their website. So we're getting close to the reporting period now. I would anticipate within a few days after February 15th, you'll be able to go to DEP's website and see by well how each individual well, what the production, how many days it was in production, what the volume of production was for the last half of last year. So July 1st to December 31st, that data will be available on, on February, or you know, shortly after February 15th. It has to be reported to DEP on February 15th. Okay, one word about pooling and unitization because this is an area that generally is not regulated by the state. With traditional wells, a lot of wells were, the land was not placed, was not pooled together, was, was not placed in a unit, so wherever the well was drilled, that particular landowner got all of the royalties on, on that gas, regardless of where the gas came from. With shale wells, Generally, we're, we're, we're pooling larger acreage, and then a landowner, uh, the, the, the royalties from that well will be shared by everyone that's within that drilling unit. Now, the, the, the point that I wanted to highlight here is, I guess, just to go through the example first. So, if, if the drilling unit is 640 acres, and this is not a size that's established by statute, this is something that a company generally has discretion to create that drilling unit. Most gas leases, certainly gas leases that are signed today, will have a pooling provision in there where the landowner is granting authority to the gas company to pool that land with other land to create a drilling unit. So the authority for pooling comes from the lease itself, not from state law. So when land is pooled, just as an example, if a drilling unit is 640 acres, and again, it's up to the company to decide what that size is, consistent with the authority they have from the lease agreements, if the landowner owns 64 of those acres, then the landowner owns 10% of the land within that, that drilling unit, and the landowner will get 10% of the royalties that are produced. Not 10% of the you know, not a 10% royalty, but 10% of the royalties because the landowner owns 10% of the land within the drilling unit. So the composition of that unit, it's determined by the energy company based on the authority they have in the lease agreement. You know, a lot of people think that the state should be involved in drilling units in a lot of states, that, a lot of other states the state is, but in Pennsylvania, for the most part, the state is not involved in that decision. <clears throat> now, just one other point that really is more applicable to landowners, but if only a portion of the land is included in that drilling unit, generally all of that land will be held by production unless you have a provision in the lease that, that, that changes that. Okay, so I said that, that generally the state is not involved in that the decision of, of where drilling units are, what the size or composition of those drilling units is. Yes? When is the company... Let me just repeat some of this because I'll, I'll, I'll forget it as I go, as I go along. So, 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 so when, when a permit, when someone, when a company applies for a permit, they're required, when they apply for the permit with DEP, they are required to submit a map that shows where the horizontal wells are traveling, what properties these wells are traveling underneath. Really, underneath your lane. Okay, so the question is, if you, if you are one of those owners that has a well going underneath your, or a proposed well, the drill, the, the, the well bore going underneath your land, when are you notified? 
I think the answer is when you see the big trucks start to drive by. That, that's when you're notified. No. Yeah. The notice is only required to the surface landowners and to the, the owners of the water of, of the water within a thousand feet. I think this is another example of the statutes that we have are designed for that traditional drilling. You know, they really aren't weren't contemplating that you would have other landowners that, that might be affected. DEP does not review, you know, they don't do a title search when they get these maps to to make sure that the company actually has the rights to drill under these properties. Um, so, I mean, it, you can kind of see where there might be a potential problem if you're not getting notified and DEP's not looking at this. Now, you may have some, some recourse, um, because this is public information, so once when you find out, you may have some recourse if, if a company is trespassing under your land then you would, and, and, and they don't have, a, well, if they're trespassing, they don't have authority, you would have some recourse against them in a private suit, but for the... You would have the right to see the permit that they filed, if you were aware of it. Yes, if you're aware of it, but obviously you have to be aware of it to know, to, 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 to make that effort to look for it. Could be owned by someone who's dead. The question is, it, 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 is it possible for the well bore to, to go under landowners that have they own the surface. The landowners that own the surface, do, do they own the subsurface? No. They don't own the subsurface. If, if, the well, if a landowner owns the surface, does not own the subsurface, they would have it, no recourse. Those landowners would have no recourse because uh, their only interest is in the surface estate. And, and tomorrow afternoon, I'll be talking more about the, those landowners and what some of the rights that they have. But in a nutshell, the, uh, they don't have an interest in the subsurface estate. Their surface estate is not being impacted. So they, legally, they have suffered no harm. Now, if they do own the natural gas rights and they have not signed a lease, then they would have a private cause of action for a subterranean trespass against the gas company, but first they have to find out that that, that well actually traveled underneath, underneath the land. Now we're getting the question, generating questions. I think I saw the hand here and then we'll go on this side. The, uh, so the landowner that um, owns the gas rights but did not sign a lease, and so in that situation the well bore cannot go under that landowner's land. It's a trespass to do so. The land, the, the well could go right up next to the land, you know, right up. I mean, we're, we're drawing boundaries, kind of artificial boundaries. We're going down through into the subsurface estate and extending the surface property boundaries into the subsurface. And if, the, if, if a well bore travels under that land that has not been leased, that's a subterranean trespass. If the well bore goes right to the property line, if gas comes... If gas comes from underneath it, that's, that's lawful. There's not a problem with that, and not a legal problem with that. It would be like the apples from your neighbor's tree fell into your yard. You can pick them up. Yeah, so the example, the yeah. apples falling from a neighbor's yard on, onto, your, onto your... Okay, question here. Yeah, this is the comment that the, 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 the person knows someone that it happened where they did not sign a lease, um, the... the they had two acres of their property that, that, where there was a trespass and they received a check. Now, you know, I think if that happens, I would advise to talk to an attorney because they're, they may have, you know, the company's trying to pay them for those damages, but, you know, it might be worth more than, than that. The question is, there, is there a state, I'm sorry, you said a state min, minimum royalty? Minimum royalty. There, there's a... There's a guaranteed minimum royalty act that requires or states that a lease is not valid unless it provides for at least a one-eighth royalty. But what you're referring to where that if, if a very small portion of your land is included in the unit, then they do not have to pay a royalty. That, that's not, there's not a law in Pennsylvania that, that states that. I mean, they are required, if they include you know, a .17 acres of your land, they have to pay you royalties based on the 0.17 acres.
Yeah, okay, so generally the state, or for Marcellus Wells at least, the state is not involved with establishing the drilling units. There is a law in Pennsylvania, the oil and gas conservation law, and you know, conservation principles in oil and gas are, are, are different than I think the common understanding of what a conservation law would be. Um, but conservation laws in oil and gas basically mean we're going to extract the gas as efficiently as possible and not have any type of waste, not waste the resource, not um, have waste by drilling more wells than are necessary. If you picture, you know, you've seen pictures of around Oil City following the, 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 the um, you know, in the boom days where you had just derrick after derrick after derrick. That's wasteful because you're spending more money than you need to, to put up those wells. The, uh, the pressure is being affected, so you're actually extracting less gas than you would extract if you had a fewer number of wells. Those are all wasteful principles that conservation laws are, are trying, to, uh, trying to prevent against. So the conservation law is, is really to promote the, the efficient drilling, to promote the efficient extraction of, of the resources. It was enacted in Pennsylvania in 1960. It only applies to wells that penetrate the Onondaga horizon. And the, so you could refer to these as deep wells, but you know, that's somewhat of an arbitrary terminology because Marcellus, you can see in blue is the Onondaga um, limestone. The Marcellus is above the Onondaga. So the conservation law does not apply to wells that are drilled into the Marcellus Shale Formation. However, the Utica Shale is below the Onondaga horizon. So in theory, a Utica well could be a conservation well, where Marcellus well is not going to be a conservation well. So what does it what does the conservation law do? It provides a mechanism for the state to get involved with the spacing of wells. So when a well is drilled, if, it, if it's below the Onondaga horizon, then any person in interest, so it could be the person that drilled the well, it could be a neighbor, they can petition DEP for DEP to establish spacing, a, a spacing order. So essentially, then DEP will decide where the wells are located. You know, not specifically. It won't say we're going to put a well in this specific location. But it will, if you want to look at it in a, in a very simple fashion, it will impose a grid over the area, over the, the, the area where this gas is coming from, so that you can drill one well in each of these grid spaces. So think about, you know, laying a piece of graph paper or or um, you know, something else that has, it's not going to always be rigid lines, but, but DEP is going to establish a series of units that you can put one well in each of those units. Now where forced pooling comes in is the units, the unit lines that are established by DEP are not going to match up with the property lines. So it's likely, I mean, th that is one of the factors that they can consider, but it's likely when they establish these, these, these units in a spacing order that you're going to have multiple landowners within a, an individual spacing unit. In that case, those land, and I say landowners, but if the landowners have signed leases, then it would be the companies, whoever holds the rights to drill, the, those multiple parties would come together and determine how they're going to develop that land. So let's say that you have landowner A and landowner B and they each own 50% of the land within that spacing, within that unit, then they would have to agree how it's, going to be, how it's going to be developed. Where compulsory pooling comes in is if one of those landowners says, I don't want to drill or I don't want you to drill, where they can't agree on how they're going to develop that property, then the someone could petition DEP for an integration order and there DEP would determine how development is going to proceed. So it's possible that even though you had a landowner that does not want development, if DEP establishes a spacing order, 
And if there's someone else within that spacing order that wants to develop it, that person could petition for an integration order, and then DEP could order that development occur, even though that landowner doesn't want that to happen. Now, DEP would hold a hearing. That person would have the ability to, to kind of advocate their position. That's where forced pooling comes in. And with the oil and gas conservation law that's on the books, we have that right now, even though it, it hasn't been done. So it's really a theoretic possibility in Pennsylvania right now, but it still is a possibility. You know, with Marcellus, it wasn't really much of a concern because those wells were not conservation wells, but we'll have to see how that plays out with, um, as Utica de starts to develop. Or, you know, it already is as, it, as the development increases. Okay, just uh, Dormant Oil and Gas Act is a statute that was passed just a few years ago. And what it does is, is enables development to occur when you have a highly fractionalized ownership. So it, it's possible because of the way that oil and gas can get transferred and then through uh, when, when the owners die and it's passed on to their, to their descendants, to their heirs, you can end up with you know, hundreds of owners of the oil and gas and maybe you can't locate one of those owners. Maybe somebody owns a, you know, one 537th share, but you don't know who that person is or you can't locate them. With the Dormant Oil and Gas Act, it allows development to occur even though you can't locate that owner. There's a process where a court approves a, a trust. The proceeds that are attributable to that owner will be placed in trust. And then when that landowner is found, they would get the, the uh, royalties or, or the, whatever the financial benefits are. If they're not found within the, the time period for, um, in Pennsylvania for when the, land, or when the property reverts to the state, then that property would revert to the, to the uh, escheat to the state. Now, it's important, I guess I didn't have, have it on that last slide, but it, a lot of people want to reunite the, surface, the subsurface estate with their surface estate. And in some states, a dormant oil and gas act will do that. Not in Pennsylvania. And it, it's ex expressly stated in the statute that um, it's not the purpose to reunite that subsurface estate with the, with the surface estate. I mentioned the, the Guaranteed Minimum Royalty Act. There's been some litigation about that, but leases that have been signed after, I think, 1981 aren't valid unless they provide for a one eighth royalty. Okay, those are the statutes, the, the primary statutes that, that we have in Pennsylvania. I'll just run through some of the, the legislation that has been passed over the last, uh, I guess, three years. Really, in the big picture, it's not a tremendous amount of legislation that has been passed. The legislation has kind of picked isolated issues, which are important, but maybe not the, the biggest issues that are, that are on the table. In 2009-2010 uh, session, there were really three statutes, relevant statutes that were passed. One dealing with the Coal Bed Methane Review Board, the production reporting that I mentioned, and then one dealing with Clean and Green. Um, the reporting requirements, I, I, I discussed this, so th that must be provided each six months. Clean and green, yeah, question. Clean and green, what was that? Yep, okay. I'll get your question about clean and green. I should get that. Just some background on clean and green. It's a preferential tax assessment that land that is eligible either as agricultural land, as agricultural reserve, or as forest reserve is taxed based on its use value rather than its fair market value. So it normally results in a, well, it, it lower taxation for, for that eligible land. It's a, it's a state program, but it's administered at the county level. Not every county has it, but 55 counties in Pennsylvania, I, I believe, have a clean and green program. As development started to occur, counties were treating the impact of drilling on clean and green differently. Some were causing a rollback when development occurred. And a rollback tax is when the property is used for an ineligible purpose, then that landowner has to repay those benefits for the last seven years plus interest and, and a penalty. So, so counties were treating it differently. Some counties were, were imposing a rollback on the entire parcel 
when development occurred. Some were causing a rollback on just a small portion of the parcel. Some were saying there's no impact at all. Uh, one county was even saying if you sign a lease, we'll trigger a rollback on, on that property. So there was a, a, a thought that there needed to be uniformity in the, in the statute. So there were a lot of discussions and hearings and ultimately legislation was passed that allows leasing on clean and green land. It allows development to occur on clean and green land and it imposes rollback on the, the portion of land that's affected long term. So when you see those large development sites, you know, five acres or more, that's not what rollbacks will be imposed on. They'll be imposed on that reclaimed site. So a relatively small portion of the land will have rollback taxes assessed on it. Uh, so the restored well site and then land that's not capable of immediately being reused. Yes, question. Okay, question about, about the, uh, the, the pipelines. Um, next, I'll get that to that on the next slide. Okay, so rollbacks, they are due when the tax assessor, the county assessor, receives that initial production report. And this was actually, there was a small tweak that was passed in legislation in 2011. So we've actually had two bills dealing with clean and green that, that have been passed. And as a result of the second statute, the second bill, now it's, it's when the assessor receives that production report. Okay, so what is specifically excluded? Pipelines are specifically excluded from the rollback. And then if a surface owner does not own the gas rights, there will not be rollbacks assessed. So those surface owners have a limited ability to control what happens, and so the General Assembly excluded those landowners from having a rollback assessed. Okay, coal bed methane review board. This deals with uh, disputes that arise between surface owners and the owners of the coal bed methane. It doesn't deal with Marcellus, it doesn't deal with gas outside of coal bed methane, but I think we have the same issues with Marcellus as we do with coal bed methane, where you have a different person that owns the surface than the person that owns the gas rights. And at least with regard to coal bed methane, this, this board, it's a three-member board that the, uh, that the governor appoints, and then this board will, um, they'll be, well, the, land, the surface owner will be notified that a well or an access road is going to be cited. Then they can file objections, and then the board will convene a conference, try to resolve the dispute. If they can't, the board will make a determination, and then that determination can be appealed to the Court of Common Pleas. So again, it, doesn't, it only applies to coal bed methane, but this might serve as a, you know, depending on how the application of it works, it could serve as a model for other disputes with the surface owners and the, and the owners of, of the gas. Okay, in, this, uh, the, in the current legislative session, there have been four main bills. Uh, the Coal and Gas Resource Coordination Act deals with that interplay of, of coal and gas. We've had the clean and green again, which I mentioned. The Pipeline Safety and Oversight uh, Bill, that was passed or signed by the governor in December, and that gives the PUC more oversight over pipelines. This is an area that really was not regulated, and now PUC has some greater authority. And then the 911 emergency response information, that was actually signed by the governor yesterday, that requires certain emergency information to be placed um, along the road. It also requires certain inf emergency information be provided to authorities so that there can be a better response when there is a problem at a, uh, at a gas well. Okay, a couple questions here. The question, does it require gas, does this 911 emergency information pr require companies to provide the contents of the, uh, of the chemicals that are used? Th this bill, and I, I haven't studied it detailed, but it's, it's relative, it's like a three-page bill. I think it just deals with location information. It's just designed to make it so that, so that when there is a problem, the emergency responders know where to go. Because a lot of these drilling rigs, there are access roads that, that go back, and they, it can be hard to locate them. So I think they're required to provide GPS information, 
Um, I think they're required to post some information out at a, at a public road. So it's, it's really limited to the, to the location. Yeah, so it requires them to generate a 911 address. So it's, it's really just so that there can be access to the, uh, to, to the well. A question here? So the question about the, the emergency responders knowing the chemicals that, that are being used and another comment that Scott Detrow from State Impact um, PA on NPR has attended some, some sessions where the first responders were being, um, were being trained. I mean, my, my understanding is there, there is information about what chemicals are being used. Uh, I'm not sure about the specific amounts of, of each chemical. And there, there's a website, um, Frac Focus, which it's an industry website, but it has a lot of information about, about the, the chemicals a, a, as well. And, I, and so, so some of that information is, is available. There, there has been legislation at the federal level to, uh, to get more disclosure, um, but I, I don't think those bills have really advanced much. Uh, Senator Casey in, has introduced a, a bill called the Frac Act, and um, part of that bill was designed to, to increase disclosure. Okay, I've talked about the legislation that has been passed, kind of the, the, you know, the big topic is, well, what about legislation that's pending? And their legislation was passed in both the Senate and the House last year that dealt with a lot of topics. Uh, I think the, it started out as a, the impact fee where it would establish a, a fee where money would go back to the state or back to the to localities or to other areas to uh, compensate for the impacts of, of drilling. It also, uh, these bills added in a, 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 an aspect of local, to address local regulation. Um, the bill would actually, uh, you know, I talked about the Oil and Gas Act. It would just completely um, revoke the Oil and Gas Act and replace it. So, you know, there's, these are big legislation, big bills that have been discussed. The Senate and the House passed different versions, and they are in the process of trying to reconcile those, those differences. So when I said it could change tomorrow, you know, in theory it could. I mean, they could, they could resolve those differences and, and pass the legislation quickly or not at all. You know, it's, it's difficult to predict how, how things are going to, uh, to develop. I will, I'll talk about preemption, and, I, and I, with 20 minutes, I'll have to, we have two topics left to discuss, so I'll kind of run through some of the specific regulatory developments over the last few years, and then we'll touch on the municipal preemption. Okay, so there are a number of different state agencies that are involved. You know, DEP is by far involved the most, but, but some of these other agencies have some role in the, uh, the regulation as, as well. And then at the federal level, we have the two interstate river basin commissions in Pennsylvania in the eastern and central part of the state that have a role in regulation. FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has some role over the interstate trans, uh, transmission, interstate pipelines. And then EPA, really to date, EPA has had a very small role, although I think we may see that increase o over time. I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of these specific regulatory developments, but I just want to identify some of the topics that, that DEP has addressed over the last few years. Um, in 2008, really, is when the, the regulatory agencies started treating Marcellus differently than historic development. And DEP required that a specific application addendum be prepared to address the, the Marcellus specific, you know, the issues that are, that are different with Marcellus drilling and increase the permits to more, ref, to more accurately reflect the cost of administering the, uh, in, in the enforcement and oversight. In 2010, DEP established wastewater standards. There, were a lot, there was a lot of concern that wastewater was being treated but not treated appropriately and, and being disposed into water. So wastewater standards were, were developed. Uh, well casing standards were heightened in 2011 in an attempt to minimize the methane migration problems. Air quality is a topic that um, they've been addressing through studies over the last couple years. They've done studies that 
three different studies, and, and those studies were basically had similar results that they were detecting some components of gas drilling in the air, but not at a level that would be harmful to human health. Uh, they just recently issued guidance on air um, ag um, aggregation to determine, you know, if you have a bunch of wells located in close proximity, how does, how does that impact what companies need to do? And then just uh, recently, uh, it's kind of on the table right now, looking at the erosion and sediment control plans. Uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of the enforcement actions. Just kind of the two that have received the most attention are the, uh, the, the Dimmick water situation and then the well blowout in Clearfield County um, that uh, where the, 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 the frac fluid and, 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 and you know, a lot of substances were spraying into the air for a number of hours. The SRBC is charged with water quantity, with, with regulating water quantity. So any withdrawal of water within the Susquehanna River Basin must receive approval. For natural gas drilling, any use of water must receive approval from the SRBC. In the Delaware River Basin, they have a mission of water quantity and water quality, and they are in the process of developing regulations. In the, in the interim, there is no development in the Delaware River Basin until they promulgate the, these, these regulations. The public comment period has ended. They've had a number of meetings scheduled but the meet, to, to consider or vote on the regulations. That's continued to be um, postponed. So right now, they're still in development, still in process, have not been voted on. And I, I think it's somewhat ironic that of all the various government agencies in Pennsylvania, the DRBC has been the most cautious of any of the agencies, and they're facing two lawsuits um, because they have not, uh, the allegations are that they haven't adequately considered the environmental impact. So, you know, I guess it, I find it somewhat ironic that they have been the most cautious, but yet, uh, you know, SRBC hasn't been sued, DEP hasn't been sued, but DRBC has been. One of those by the city of Philadelphia, is that right? Um, there are two suits, and I'm... Um, I'm not sure that the city of Philadelphia is, 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 one, is one of the parties, um, but there, there are, there's one suit that is against the individual members of the DRBC. Another suit is against the DRBC itself. But, but generally, they both involve whether or not there was a requirement to comply with the federal laws requiring that, that environmental impact assess whether environmental studies are done before the action is taken. And DRBC is, is you know, it's not, a, it's, it's not organized the same way as the EPA. So there's some question about what federal laws they have to comply with. And that's really what's at issue in, in the litigation. It's also a multi-state compact. Exactly. It's a multi-state. It has members from all the states that are within that basin. And so it's a, somewhat of a different animal than than EPA, but it is federally, it is created by federal law. Okay, EPA has oversight over the um, underground injection control program. That is one way of disposing of waste where you inject the, it into the ground, into underground wells. That's not really used much in Pennsylvania because of the geology of, in Pennsylvania. It is in Ohio and in Texas, and you may have heard about earthquakes and a concern in Ohio as well as Arkansas that the underground injection wells that, 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 that's causing earthquakes. Um, but in Pennsylvania, it's not as much of a concern, although I, I've heard some, some discussions that maybe it's being used. There are underground injection wells in Pennsylvania, but to my knowledge, it's not being used very much, if at all to dispose of, of, of the, the waste here. There is, uh, in Clearfield County and Bell Township, there okay. is um, a deep injection well uh, run by Exco. Okay. And they were just fine. Um, they're taking oil and gas um, brine. Okay, so. Um, and and they, they had a, bio, a groundwater violation. Okay, so. The, last month. So there is one well that's operating in Clearfield County, Bell, Bell Township. Oil, oil for, for oil and gas by Exco, a comment that they were that they were recently fined. Um, the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act that's received a lot of discussion. The the so-called Halliburton loophole, where EPA does not have oversight 
over hydraulic fracturing from natural gas from from natural gas based on you know in the federal law there's an exclusion under the federal safe drinking water act so EPA does not have oversight over hydraulic fracturing but they were charged in a recent appropriations bill to do a study so they're undergoing a study if you, if you're interested in more information they have a pretty good website that you can find out more details on on this hydraulic fracturing study that's underway. There are seven sites that are being studied. Three of them are in Pennsylvania. We'll get some initial reports, supposed to get them the end of this year. Uh, the, the PUC, generally, companies do not have the ability to use eminent domain to acquire rights of way. The exceptions would be under federal law if they get approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for an interstate transmission line. And then at the state level, if they are declared a public utility, then they would have that right of eminent domain. Laser Northeast, this was a, got a lot of attention where they were trying to, to gain status as a public utility. Ultimately, they withdrew that application after there were a number of administrative hearings. So this is an issue that I think bears watching as to whether companies are going to gain status as a public utility, which would give them the power of eminent domain. But generally, companies have to acquire those pipelines just by, by um, agreements through, with, through the landowners. Our neighbors to the, New York, to the north, New York, has taken a different approach to to drilling and, and they have essentially had a moratorium on high volume hydrofracking, which is required to extract gas from the shale. They have promulgated a, a draft environmental impact statement, uh, draft regulations. They had a comment period which has now closed. And so the next step will be for them to make a decision on, on whether or not they're going to issue those regulations and what the content of those regulations are. Okay, with municipal regulation, the Oil and Gas Act has uh, section 602 provides for uh, or addresses the extent to which municipal decisions or ordinances are preempted by state law. And this is the, 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 the statute virtually in its entirety. It's, it has two really key components of preemption. The first, what's in yellow now, is a complete preemption. And this states that if the municipality is, can only act through the municipality's planning code or the floodplain management act. So if it's not acting under the authority of one of those two statutes, the ordinance is preempted. It cannot, a municipality cannot regulate oil and gas except through those statutes. The second part of the, uh, of the ordinance states that even where, it's a limited preemption, so even where a municipality has acted through the authority of those statutes, it can't regulate the same features that are regulated by the Oil and Gas Act, and it can't regulate to accomplish the same purposes as are set forth in the Oil and Gas Act. So that's kind of the, the, the you know, everything, when you analyze whether a municipality can act, you, you have to go back to this section. This is really what establishes the framework. And then there's a, a final sentence in this section that says the Commonwealth hereby preempts and supersedes the regulation of oil and gas as herein defined. So, you know, this, this is the guidance. It's, it's not necessarily absolutely clear. It doesn't provide a lot of examples, but this is, this is the, the heart of any analysis of whether an ordinance is permissible or not. Uh, the question about whether referenda would fall under, under these provisions. I, I, I think it would. You know, you'd have to look at the statute and see, does it fit within the language of what, of what is preempted? You know, it's talking about um, oil and gas well operations, but I don't see why, why anything would be outside of that framework. And we did have the one situation in, um, I think it was in Washington County, where the one, was Mount, it was South Fayette, was it South Fayette, or Mount, it was Mount Pleasant, where the I was thinking maybe it was South Fayette, but, but in any event, it was a, a municipality was trying to stop the referendum because they would, the suit would be against the municipality regardless of how, how it was passed. Yeah, Mount Pleasant has other issues. I think there's current litigation in Mount Pleasant. I think actually that, that might have been warranted. 
Warren had one as well. Warren's did not pass. State College did. There were a couple others that, that did pass. You might want to mention about the current uh, conference between 1100 and 1500. Uh, the preemption is uh, total. Yeah, with 1100, with the, the legislation that's on the table right now, the, it would set up a process. I, Leah stood up, so I think I'm getting... Chris, it's that time now. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's on the table exactly how it's going to be handled in, in, the, legis, in the, the current bill. Um, there is Supreme Court case law that provides some guidance as to, gives us one example of what municipalities can do, one example of what municipalities can't do. We've had uh, a, a Commonwealth Court decision, so, so a lower court decision that, that upheld an ordinance, and this was an ordinance that was a little bit broader than the one that the Supreme Court upheld. So this, this gives a little bit more guidance to uh, municipality, and these were the the specific restrictions that were in the, in the Fayette County ordinance. So I, I think at, at that point, I just had a couple more slides, so I think we'll just, we'll just end here since we're out of time. But, but thank you for your time, and if anyone does want a copy of the PowerPoint, just, just let me know. Send me an email, and I can forward that to you. So thank you very much.